Welcome to Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. So glad you're with us. You can always find us at goodlifetelevision.org. So many of you have joined us there from all over the world and we're grateful. Uh, The purpose here is to inspire, to honor, to encourage, to educate, and to empower. And we, we've had so many wonderful guests that have done, done those things. Um, we, we've been inspired by stories of people you've never heard of, some people you have heard of, some of them in between, uh, young and old, all walks of life, all professions. So it's been a really wonderful journey we've been on. So thank you for being here with us. I'm really excited about uh, my guest today. He's a, he's a dear friend in addition to being a, a corporate executive and, um, and, and you're going to hear the rest of the story in a moment. Uh, John Mullen is with me. John, welcome. Great, Great to be here. John is, is Bachelor of Science from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo in Civil Engineering and a Master's in Global Leadership from Fuller Seminary. That's kind of an interesting combination. That, that really summarizes you in some ways. <laughs> that, that combination, civil engineering and global leadership from Fuller Seminary. Well, um, I, I wasn't a great civil engineer, so I moved on to the spiritual on. side <laughs> to try that. Good. Uh, John's companies over the years have grossed over $500 million in sales. And so John was really successful uh, in business. Um, but that's actually not even the most interesting part of the story. But let's start with your life, though. Let's start with kind of your growing up, your what it was like for you coming up and your family of origin. Start there. Sure. So uh, we moved down here uh, to Santa Barbara when I was uh, seven years old. And uh, my dad uh, uh, was was an entrepreneur. He died at 92 years old. And he was still entrepreneuring at 92. And so he was an incredible inspiration in my life. And when I was growing up in Santa Barbara, you know, because we're a beach community, uh, all my friends would surf, right, when I was a teen. Well, I, my dad had me working at his factory. So my dad manufactured furniture, so I would spend eight hours a day, I, I think making $2 an hour, um, during my summer working for my dad. Wow. But during that time, I was able to just watch him. He was incredibly gifted. He would, you know, he was an industrial designer. and. And so I just sat back and, and saw this in, incredible model in my life of someone who uh, cared deeply about what he was doing. Mm-hmm. And so as I was growing up and getting older, you know, I began to kind of look at, well, you know, what do I want to do with my life? And I knew that I didn't want to follow exactly in his footsteps, but I knew I wanted to go to college. Um, and uh, it's really interesting because when I was in, I tell my kids this story, when I was in sixth grade at Monroe School in Santa Barbara, I ran for president. And I still remember who I ran against. I still remember all that happened. Uh, I didn't win, I, I lost. And I told my kids, I said, you know, um, I lost as president, so later on I built my own companies and named myself president. <laughs> so it all worked out. Right, one way or the other. Yeah, yeah. And didn't your dad, did, weren't you like 33 or something, and your dad came to you and said, Johnny, it's yes. your time. Yeah, I was, so I graduated from Cal Poly University in civil engineering, came to Santa Barbara and worked as a, as a civil engineer, and then uh, began with a develop, land development co- company because my desire was ultimately to become a real estate developer. And um, uh, around when I was 32 years old, working for this land development company owned by a family, they decided to wind down the operations. And I still remember, like at that time, just, you know, what am I going to do? And I, I called my dad, and at that point, my dad was in Chicago, and we're on the phone, and he just said, Johnny, it's your time. And I said, well, what do you mean, Dad? He said, look, at you've got this entrepreneurial blood. It's time for you to start your own company. So literally, as I was winding down from that company, um, I still remember I was in their offices, and I had, this is a point where there were now computers and printers, and I'm printing out uh, my resume, I'm printing out all these proposals while I'm winding down in this one company, I'm starting <laughs> up a new business. And so that was the beginning of JM Consulting Group, uh, which I always said, well, it, it was only me, but it will ultimately grow, and it did. It grew into about 250 employees. That's incredible. And so you had the JM Consulting, and then you had the d- uh, development side. Yeah. 
where you've done a ton of residential, 500 homes or 700 residential homes in Southern California. Yeah, so, so in the 90s, while I was doing uh, real estate consulting, the wireless, you know, they be, the FCC um, began to issue um, uh, licenses for wireless phones. And, and so if you remember in the early 90s, we started getting these cell phones. We moved into that industry, so I became a wireless telecom consultant, and that grew our business in the 90s. And then in the mid-90s, uh, my dream was to, uh, to do real estate development, and so I formed JM Development. So we had two companies, and then in the uh, 2000s, we were building about 100 homes a year in the Central wow. Coast. You know, the wireless phone thing kind of stuck. Yeah, yeah, turns yeah. out, yeah. yeah, it sure did. <laughs> let's let's fast forward to two thousand two, um, and and talk about your journey with some of this, you know, I don't know if I want to call it mission work, but some of this overseas work that you've done, um, specifically um, around the country of Mozambique, which I didn't know a lot about. I, I did read a little bit that about the cyclones and the poverty and the landmines mm. and that 11 percent of girls go beyond elementary school and and, and I was, I, it was interesting to read about this but you ended up in Mozambique in 2002. Start there and kind of tell us what that was about sure. and then we can kind of go from there. Yeah so you know at that time you know I, I was in my late 40s I had been very successful in business and I literally was close to retirement if, it, if I would choose to retire. And so, you know, and I had been involved in, uh, you know, uh, some mission work, you know, li like we all, all do, you know, go on a three day trip, but I'd never really gone to a third world country. And um, I was invited to go to Mozambique. I didn't know a lot about Mozambique. Um, I mean, literally, I had to look at it on a map to find out where it was and found out it was one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, I agreed to go on this missions trip with my friend Douglas Bowman. And, um, and I remember, you know, this, uh, this, this kind of uh, evolving revelation of Mozambique. You know, initially, it's like, this will be a great trip. This will be fun. I'll tag this on to what I've already done, my successful career. And I remember as I found out more and more, I found out, well, this is a country that's gone through civil war. Uh, it's a country that's had massive flooding and a country where there's, uh, you know, there was a million landmines that were laid in the ground. So I start getting this fear about going down to Mozambique. Right. At that point, I can't back out. And so um, I remember Douglas and I flew to Atlanta and we're about to get on the plane in Atlanta. We were going with a missions organization and, um, and I'm at the counter, uh, you know, to pick up my, my, uh, my seats. And this woman goes, you know, Mr. Mullen, um, I know that you received, you had tickets in, 50, in row 15A. And I had flown enough, you know, a 747, 400 to know that that's in business class. And I thought, this is a great missions organization. <laughs> she goes, Mr. Mullen, I'm sorry, we've made a big mistake. You're not in 15A, you're in the middle of row 73. Now, I remember uh, walking down that aisle all the way to the back of the plane, you know, clutching my uh, overnight bag like it was a life preserver. And I literally am going, where am I going? And I, I ended up in the back of the plane in the middle seat. And, I'm, um, and I finally get myself into that middle seat and I've got a guy to the right of me and a guy to the left of me and they're both going on this missions trip. And I turn to the guy at the right and, and I'm looking at him, he's missing a finger on one of his, his hands. And I turn to him and I said, hey, um, I know we're going to the same place. My doctor told me if I take the malaria medication, I'll just be fine, you know, that I'll be safe. And he looks back at me, he goes, you know, I was a missionary for six years in, in East Africa. I took the medication, I still got malaria. <laughs> so now I'm convinced I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die in this third world country that I know nothing about. I turn to my left and there's this, this big oversized guy that's spilling over into my seat. And I remember um, when they, the plane was ready to go, there was a seat available I could see that was a window seat. And I thought, gosh, I want that seat. And um, so I turned to him and I say, hey, I can give you a little bit more room and you know, I'm gonna go get that seat. And he, he turns to me and he puts his arm around and he goes, no way, I wanna get to know you. 
And so I'm going, really? I'm stuck 17 hours between these two. I'm sandwiched between these two guys. Oh and so, um, you know, we flew down to Cape Town and then from Cape Town to Johannesburg and then we flew into Mozambique. And I remember, uh, you know, I just thought I'm, I'm going to my death. I mean, like, I'm not going to survive in this country. And um, so we get there. We arrive in Maputo, Mozambique, which is the capital. And we're going to a place in Sampeto where this conference center is, but there, where they have a children's center. And I remember um, arriving there and they took us out to see this dump site in the middle of the city. And you got to realize, like in Mozambique, I mean, this is this is a country where the average person lives on about a dollar and a half a day. So it's an extremely poor country. And they take us out to this dump site and at this dump site, um, people, I mean, it's not a dump site like we're used to. This is a dump site where people live in the dump. They literally live there. And so they live in cardboard houses. Uh, the trash trucks come in. They're climbing you know, all over the trash trucks trying to get food. And this is how these people live. And I remember there was um, a phrase that they would use, that this ministry would use, and it was stop for the one. And what they said was, look at, we're gonna stop for that one person that's in front of us, the one person that's broken, the one person that's an amputee, that's the person we're going to focus on. And it just really, really stuck with me. So we were there for 10 days, just watching this ministry. And, and it was changing my heart. I mean, I literally was realizing like, I've never experienced this before in my life. And, and it, was, it was just amazing. We get to the last night and um, we had been at a village the day before um, and I had eaten some food and I was very sick. This is the night before we're going to leave and come back home. And, they're, and they line up everybody on this concrete wall because the head of this ministry, Heidi Baker, was going to come and pray for everyone. And I thought, yeah, I, I need prayer and I'd like her to pray for me. So I'm waiting and she never gets to me. But three 13-year-old Mozambican boys, they come and they lay a prayer cloth on me. And they lay hands on me and as they begin to pray over me, I just start weeping and I can't stop weeping. And I realize, like, God has brought me halfway around the world. And I've been a Christian for 20 years, but he brought me halfway around the world that I might meet Jesus. Mm. And I met Jesus right there because I realized as wealthy as I was coming from the United States, I was poor. Mm. And he was calling me to be a person who was poor in spirit. So that was my first encounter with Mozambique. Wow. That's amazing. Um, let's go to 2015, and then I want to get back to that in terms of what happened to you. But so 2015, you end up reconnecting with Douglas Bowman. You're taking a walk on the beach in Santa Barbara, and kind of take us from there in terms of what happened and how we get to this story. Which, by the way, I will mention now, John. They've written a great book that I was reading last night called Florencia. We're gonna talk about Florencia in a second, but I commend it to you, it's a, it's a really great book. But take us 2015 and how we got to Florencia. Douglas and I were on the trip in 2002 in Mozambique, and then we both come back and our, our uh, lives kind of, you know, uh, move away from one another. He goes to New Zealand as a pastor, I continue in business in the early 2000s, kind of go back to what I was doing and he went back to what he was doing beforehand. And in, in 2015, we reconnect. He comes back to Santa Barbara and I haven't seen him for quite some time. And we begin to just take these walks. And as we're walking, we, we are reminiscing about what happened in Mozambique and realizing like this was a pivotal moment in both of our lives. So we think, well, let's write a book. Let's write a book about uh, our experience in Mozambique. And really from sort of a Westerner perspective, it was really, uh, let's write a selfie book. Let's write a book about ourselves because we think all these people are gonna be interested in who we are. And my so, road to humility. Well, yeah, I know, my road. My, road. <laughs> my five secrets to success. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Humble. And so we began to write this book. We wrote 13 chapters of this book. And 
we're starting it, it, we're in, th in chapter 13 we're starting to really look into Mozambique and look into these floods and look into the depth of the poverty and one of the things we we, we come upon is that these landmines uh, were in, in, in Mozambique and so these are landmines that had been put in the ground because there was a civil war that was going on so they're putting them in the ground right uh, regarding the the opposing army right, right? But they're left there, and they're left there for years. And so now, um, and, and, and a landmine's not discriminating. It, it, it doesn't know who's above the ground. And so now they're, they're sitting in the waterways, they're sitting in the pathways, and civilians are stepping on these landmines. And it's just devastating what's going on in this country. So as we're doing our research, we uh, find this article in National Geographic. It's an article on the demining efforts in Mozambique that are taking place. And in those demining efforts, they're talking about women going into demining, helping to demine the country and going from $1.50 a day to $10 a day. And we thought, gosh, this is great. Well, the last um, paragraph of that article, as if it's an afterthought, they tell us about this 17-year-old girl, Florencia. They show us a picture of her, and uh, they tell us her story. And in her story, she, we, we learn that she was out um, collecting firewood. She lived in a village, Makachula, in Mozambique. She's out collecting firewood, and she, um, it, it's just a, a regular day, and she, uh, she's reaching to, to, to get a piece of firewood, and she steps on a landmine, and it blows off her leg. And it's, it's just uh, it's, there's this massive gnarled flesh. She's lying there and uh, all her mother sees from her hut is this smoke rising, you know, off in the distance. And they run and they find Florencia. She's lying on the ground and she's, she's half dead. And, and this, uh, this paragraph is telling us about her story as a kind of an afterthought, you know. And um, Douglas and I read that, and we thought, how can we write a selfie book and not tell her story? How can we not find her? Like, we need to locate this woman. We need to, we need to bring her help, you know? And so that began this journey in finding Florencia. And it's amazing she survived. Didn't they have to drive four hours to the hospital? They had to take her four hours because in Makachula, like even when we, we went back down there, you're driving off the road into the sand going to the bush country. And uh, you realize, like, the, you know, it's not like America. They're not uh, heading over to CVS to pick up their medication. They're not heading over to Cottage Hospital to, you know, to receive care they have to be taken you know somewhere uh, two to four hours away and again she's she's dying in the back of a pickup truck while this is all taking place when she was bl when she stepped on the landmine her leg was blown off she had cashews in her pocket the cashews fell on the ground and we'll get back to that at the yes. end yeah. so keep that in mind cashews falling on the ground now you read the article let's do something let's find her you rally a group of students from the local high school um, who want to help want to go on the trip and take us from there yeah so what really happens is we begin we, we take the article and we we look at it and we go first of all who wrote the article well we find out that the woman who wrote the article was Katia Sangal she was an adjunct professor at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And it, we're like, we can't believe this for National Geographic. So uh, we contact her, we write her an email, and she writes back. And all we say is, hey, we're two guys here in Santa Barbara. We learned about Florenza. You did an article on her, which means you went down there. Um, we'd like to help her. We'd like to help her in some way, in some manner. And she writes back and she says, hey, if you want to help her, Here's the contact in Mozambique. His name's Adorito Ismael. Now, he was with Handicap International, and he was a D-minor, but he was the one who originally uh, brought Katia 
um, up to Macachula to interview um, uh, Florencia. So we contact Adorito Ismael. Now, this is a guy that is busy. He's got a lot going on. We don't hear anything back. It's two weeks later. And finally, he's looking at his emails and he sees our email. And he realizes, oh my gosh, there's these two guys that are in California and they want to help Florencia. So he spends two and a half days out of his schedule and goes up into her village to find her. Mm. When he finds her, he takes a letter from us to, you know, to say, introduce who we are and to say, we'd like to help her get a prosthetic leg. So he's with her and he's talking with her and, and uh, he says, you know, these guys would like to help you get a prosthetic leg. And her response to that was, what's a prosthetic leg? She had no idea because in Mozambique, uh, those who ha are amputees often crawl on the ground or they have makeshift crutches, but they don't, they don't have the technology. They don't know about a prosthetic leg. So anyway, but he said, look at Florencia, there's two guys in California that want to help you walk. Do you want to walk again? And she nodded. She had her, her little son, Gilda, who she couldn't carry. And she um, really, her life had been completely just cut off and limited because she was an amputee. So we found Florencia through Adorito. And, um, and then from that point, we began to look at, okay, how do we, it, you know, we're, we promised something here. <laughs> you know, how do we deliver on our promise? Well, the tough news was that it would cost twelve to fifteen thousand dollars to get a prosthetic leg in Mozambique, and and we just thought, well, we don't even know where to begin. We don't know what to do. So the second thing we did is we got back on Google, we began to look at free prosthetic legs. Like, is there anyone in this world who is giving out pre free prosthetic legs? We'll get one. We'll get her there, and we'll and we'll get her a leg. We found this uh, clinic in India, Jaipur Foot Clinic, and, um, and, and, and as we began to learn about it, we were, to, we were just amazed. The guy who runs it is DR Mehta, and I was telling you earlier, he's like a modern day Gandhi. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a nonprofit organization. So if, you're, if you live in India and you are an amputee, and there's lots of amputees in India just because of the traffic accidents and other things. If you're an amputee in India, you can get on the train anywhere in India and you can bring your family and you can arrive in Jaipur and come to the Jaipur Foot Clinic. You don't need an appointment. Uh, you just walk up and you uh, will be taken care of. They will put your family up and, and for two to three, after two to three days, you will walk out of that clinic with a prosthetic leg for free. Okay. We were just amazed. So we wrote DR Meta. And we got an immediate response. And here's what he said. He said, I love your story. This is an incredible story that you too would go halfway around the world to rescue this woman. He said, bring her to Jaipur. We will put a leg on her. She will walk out of this place. It's so amazing. So, so we, we um, just to, to end that part of it, we began to go to, to the um, local high school and we knew Dan Williams, who headed the Mad Academy at Santa Barbara High School. And uh, we, we said, hey, as we go on this trip, we really would like to bring some students with us that may be interested in film, that may be interested in, you know, just uh, letting the world know what this journey is about. And we'd love them to come with us. So we had five students that signed up with us and two of them were young filmmakers out of Santa Barbara High School. Mm -hmm. And so they began this process with the idea that they were going to, to actually film a documentary. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were on the trip. The second part of that, I'm an alumni of Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and I contacted uh, Cal Poly to, to say, hey, do you have any engineers in your program up here that would like to be part of of uh, this journey. So uh, we began to work with the senior engineers at Cal Poly and Cal Poly became very interested in this project. In fact, the uh, president of Cal Poly uh, loved what was going on. And um, we had five of those senior engineers come on this trip as well. So, so now we have five students that are high school students, 
five engineering students, and they're all coming with us on this journey. Now, we got to go down to Mozambique and pick her up, and then we've got to bring her up to Jaipur, you know, in order for her to receive a leg. Um, and that uh, they had, I mean, that had to have been a transformational trip for those students as well. But long story short, she gets the lake. And I watched a video of her walking back into her village and seeing the, the reactions of the people in her village is just powerful. Um, and there was a cashew tree. Those cashews that were in her pocket went into the ground and actually a tree emerged that, and I was just thinking about, there, there's so much um, depth to that one part of that book, just that out of brokenness, out of, it's like the seed going into the ground. Yeah. A seed can sit on this table for 75 years and nothing happens, mm. and it goes in the ground and magic happens. There's something about dying, there's something about yeah. that I thought about that story about the cashews going into the ground and then now we have this fruit. I, I mean, it's amazing what happened to you. And, I, and I, that's one of the things that I think is, 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 I mean, it was inspiring to me that here's a guy who has made it up the ladder, you know, made the money, had success, family, the kids, the house, everything, beautiful city, everything is kind of in order. And yet, you know, maybe the seed was still on the ground, on the table, you know. Yeah. And then, but then through this experience, you, through this, you know, there's a brokenness that happened is what, the way you described it to me. But talk a little bit more kind of about what happened in your heart? I mean, what, what, that, and, and what's it been like since? Because clearly you haven't forgotten this. Clearly this is still, you know, the 2002 experience and then of course what's happened since. But clearly that 2002, that, that breaking, that encounter you had with Jesus it has not faded away. And it, I mean, you can't forget it, but yeah. talk, talk about it a little bit. Well, let me begin with the cashew, and that is that at that moment in time when we, she went to collect the firewood, she had this, uh, these cashews. Now, if you look just on Google and you look up cashew trees in Mozambique, that's, you know, there's cashew trees all over the country. I mean, and they sell them, and as you're driving on the roads, they have them hanging from bags. But she had a cashew, a couple cashews in her pocket, and it drops out it goes into the ground. And so when we all went back there in 2015, and we had all the students surrounding, and we came around the area where, where she had lost her leg, where the landmine had, had blown up her leg, there's a beautiful cashew tree. And, and, it's, uh, and we end our book talking about that because it really is the story, uh, not just of Florencia, but it's our story. It's my story, and I think it's a lot of people's story. And that is, you know, something has to die in us in order for there to be life. And I know that it was interesting when I came back from Mozambique because at some level I was a changed person, but I needed to, my cashew needed to die more in the ground over the coming years. So I became one of the largest boutique builders here in Santa Barbara and we got to 2008. And I remember, um, I remember it well, like in the downturn in the economy and that recession that we went through, it was as if I now was going to descend <laughs> to a deep, dark place. I was a very wealthy person. I lived in Hope Ranch, which is, is, a, is a beautiful community here in Santa Barbara. And, I, and, and it came, what happened to me was I had to come to a place where I was working deals out with the banks. I was basically coming from my high place and God had a plan for me. And, and I think when I think of the kingdom of God as a, as a CEO of some companies, I think, you know, we often live in this world or the, this narrative where we're in a, a top down, you know, a CEO, and then we have all these employees and we have the other the people who serve us. Well, the kingdom of God is an inverted pyramid. It, right. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kingdom where Jesus says, no, 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 it isn't about being on top. It's about... Who can rush to the bottom the fastest? 
and yet we don't realize that that in this American culture. And so I literally was forced into that place where I'm selling things, I'm selling assets, I, I had, you know, rentals, all of this was sold in 2008, 2009, 2010. Can I say something yes. right here? Yes, yeah. Because I, I was talking to somebody who knows you. I've never told you this, but, and he was describing that period. He said, John Mullen is an honorable man. He walked into those banks and did the right thing. Is there, I mean, he was just talking about how you handled I mean, the 2008 was a bloodbath for everybody. I mean, in terms of this industry, but he said he he just mentioned that to me one time. He's like, he he did the honorable, he did the right thing. He did not leave, you know, cut, you know, just cut and run. I mean, he was, which I thought. Anyway, I just wanted to tell you that. Well, I, I appreciate that. You know, but going through it at the time, you know, it was very very difficult because yeah. we're raising our, you know, raising our kids. We're living here in Santa Barbara. And, and Santa Barbara, like a lot of wealthy communities, is an uppity community, you know? It's like, what car are you driving? You know, what, what uh, you know, like the clothes on your back, you know, do you shop at Nordstrom's? I mean, all of this, right? And it's like, I'm in this free fall. And, and it's, it's like, well, who am I gonna become? And, and I think during that time, I believe one of the questions that I was asking God is, God, who do you wanna be for me right now? Like, who do you wanna be for me? And I felt like he said, I want to be that. I want to be your savior like I was in Mozambique in 2002. Wow. I want you to walk with me in the brokenness of your life. Wow. And, um, and as I began to walk in that brokenness, I realized I'm a wealthy man. Yeah. Like I'm the wealthiest guy on the planet. I, 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 I'm wealthy. I, I'm just wealthy in the things that, that God has given me in his kingdom and the resources in my life with my family but just knowing jesus at a at a deep level and i feel like you know so many of my friends that have been wealthy and nothing against wealth you know they have not descended through those dark places of being the cashew that goes into the ground right. and i think god wants to take us there yeah. because he wants us to meet jesus yes yeah it can be so hard when you have money and power. I mean, the scripture says it, but, but the reason is because you're insulated, protected, you have insurance on your insurance, yeah. you know? And so to become a broken person is a really tricky thing. I mean, unless, barring something like what happened to you. Um, so, and I, and I will say that, you know, John has done some amazing things in the community, and one of them is called Believer's Edge, where for 11 years he taught men, taught 400 lessons on life and leadership to, to men, transforming lots of men in the community. So I wanted to mention that as well. I mean, that's been a wonderful fruit of all this. But last thing, we only have a couple minutes, but identity. I always think about identity. And I think what we've just described sounds a little bit like, you know, I was talking about the fake ID, you know, the fake IDs we all carry around, right. you know, the, the, the fake ID that says that I'm the businessman. I'm the, even you can, I think you can even idolize your family. I mean, or, or have your ID being in, I'm the dad of these perfect children, you know, which we're all broken up pretty quickly. Sure. But, but the fake IDs, it's kind of like, you know, trading those in for the real one, mm. the son, the beloved. Mm. Talk a little bit about that and kind of how, what happened for you. Well, you know, um, I would say when I look at the scriptures, you know, I, I mean, I probably don't have a favorite scripture, but I have a favorite theme and it's, it's being the beloved son. And, 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 you know, I, I think um, how uh, for in the New Testament, you know, how to the Jew, you know, they're watching this person, Jesus, right? And, and he starts talking to his father and using the, the word Abba, like, like daddy. Now, this is a radical, <laughs> radical term, you know, because they felt so distance from, distant from their father in heaven. And I think of that one scene where... Um, John the Baptist is baptizing Jesus, right? And, uh, and Jesus comes out of the water and the, you know, the heavens open and, and the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. 
And what I love about that image is that Jesus hadn't accomplished anything. He, um, in dynamic degrees, didn't have a successful business, didn't have 250 employees. He was just a son. And the father said, I, I am pleased in you. And I think of that story and think that, that I have received that from my Father in Heaven, that like my identity is not in my business. It's not in the things that I do, it's who I am. So my Father has said, look at, um, you're my beloved son. I'm pleased in you. So I came to a place in my life where I realized he can't love me any more than he loves me right now. Like I'm a beloved son, and we all are. We are beloved sons and daughters of our Father in Heaven. And when I think of my life that way, I think, you know, I, uh, of all men, uh, you know, am wealthy beyond anything I could ever, ever imagine. So there, there's nothing in this world that can, that can um, reach that level of yeah. my father saying, you're my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Uh, John has a TED talk. Can people access that? Yes. How do they find it? So it's a TEDx yeah. talk okay. at Oaks Christian. Right. Um, it's, a TED, it's a TEDx talk at Oaks Christian where John tells this story of Florencia, and then she comes on stage. And I'm getting chills just talking about it. Uh, it was a, it's magical. So watch it. We'll, we'll put the link up. Um, and, and, I, and again, I want to, before we go, I wanted to mention, so Florencia, this is, uh, the book is called Florencia, An Accidental Story, Douglas Bowman and John, John D. Mullen. Uh, I think you'll love it. We're going to have some uh, of these at the Turner Foundation as well. So we didn't, if, you, if you need to get, get a hold of us, we'd love to get you a copy. Uh, but it's Florencia and it's a beautiful, beautiful book. Thank you. Well, thank you. This is it's, it's been a pleasure. what a wonderful story. What a wonderful journey you've been on. And if I could just uh, thank you for the Turner Foundation, because oh, you know, you. some years ago, long I met you. Ago. Yeah, and brought my children down yeah. to the village apartments, That's and right. just was able to to minister alongside you. It, it's just That's been amazing right. to see what your foundation has done in this city. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I remember that. Somebody asked me the other day, "How did you meet John Mullen?" I said, I think he just walked in the door. Yeah, I <laughs> maybe God sent him. I don't know, but he yeah. was like he just walked in, and, and I remember learning from you so much, and it just it was powerful for me then and and now. So thank you for the impact you've had in my life. You've really impacted my life a lot. Great, so, thank you. Thank you. We're having this moment. On <laughs> we TV. are. We yeah. are. All right. Thanks, John. Thank you. We'll see you next time.